Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk once again about IEMs and headphones, and apparently it's traditional to put them on top of the iPad, so I've done that. What I want to talk to you about today is EQing um, headphones, and these are the examples I'm going to use for that. These are Sennheiser HD uh, 598s, and these are JBL Tune 130s. And these are sort of the things that introduced me to the idea of EQing. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. This is uh, FIO um, BT3K, I think. Um, Bluetooth um, interface and all that. But it also has a built-in EQ function. I want to talk about that a little bit. So, sorry, move some stuff around here. Um, I'm fairly new to EQing, so keep that in mind. I'm no expert about this, and I'm just going to be describing my experience and the kind of decisions I've made around EQing my stuff. I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of this video, but I'm quite skeptical about EQing the top end of headphones. I think you can do a pretty good job of matching them to your tastes at the low end to a point, and certainly in the mid-range and the low mids and that. But for a variety of reasons, I think trying to mess around too much with the top end, barring some pretty large moves, is, uh, is something that's not likely to be very successful. And as I said, I'll explain why in the end. And so this has led to my sort of philosophy of using EQ to make relatively minimal moves that make the general feeling of the low and mids of the headphones more to my taste. That's particularly true to these, which are out of the box, very warm, a little bit warm by today's standards, that's for sure. And that you can fix up quite nicely in EQ. Um, these have a little bit of weirdness in their uh, lower, uh, sorry, lower mids and upper bass response, which you can fix and then tame the uh, some of the slightly ridiculous low end that these have to, uh, to make them a little bit pleasanter with the kind of music I like to listen to. So the tools that I use for this are several. I'm using the notion of tools fairly broadly. On my Mac, when I'm listening to any of this stuff on there and EQing there, I use SoundSource. And they have a head headphone EQ mode, which allows you to import EQ profiles from a number of sort of well-known people who are a source for those sorts of things, at least one of which I'll be mentioning on later on on this video. On my phone, I tend to use the built-in EQ that's built into the JBL app, and I'll demonstrate that with this, or I'll use the one that's built into here. Apple stuff doesn't easily EQ from, say, iTunes or you know, Apple Music and that sort of stuff. So it's easier to use an external device for that purpose. Um, both of these operate as 10-band equalizers. It's also helpful to start with a frequency diagram of where you, of what the, you know, so that you have an idea of what the headphones look like on a chart before you start mucking around with them. And it's also helpful to have somebody else's EQ settings to start with. That gives you a starting point to modify rather than trying to just figure it out blind by ear. The chart will give you an idea, the frequency chart that is, will give you an idea of where your, it looks like it might need changes. And, uh, and then, you know, having somebody's existing EQ profile for it tells you what kind of changes they've suggested to try to remedy or modify those at the, you know, the existing profile of the headphones. Um, for that, I've tended to use oratory 1990s uh, settings if possible. I'll put a link to these sources in below. And you can also use a variety of other sources. I've had a tendency to use autoeq.app. Again, I'll link that below as well, and I'll show you how I use this stuff. There are other spots squig.link is probably the other one that people tend to use for this purpose. And there are, you know, other, like Clinical has profiles too. So there are lots of people who have profiles for different, uh, different headphones. 
So my approach in using these tools has been to want first figure out what I don't like about the headphones or IEMs that I'm talking about. So as I said before, what I don't like about these is I think they're a little warm and I think that uh, you know, you can bring up the bass a little bit. You're not going to make these very, ba very. You're not going to get a lot of sub bass out of out of these, but you get a little bit more than they come with out of the box, which would be nice. The other thing, of course, that isn't in my notes over here to the side, but that I uh, that I would uh, also like to do is preserve the characters of these that I like. These are spacious, and. Um, and in many ways very pleasant and fairly relaxed to listen to. For the JBLs, as I mentioned, I thought the top end on them was fine, if a bit reserved. And the low end I also thought was pretty good. I mean, these are very inexpensive, right? We're not expecting too much from these. Um, but I, there, there was that weirdness. There was like in these you have a sort of depression in the lower mids and upper bass and then the bass comes in very strong quite quickly after that. And I was like that, that we ought to be able to fix with an EQ. Okay, so I have an idea of what I like and what I don't like about them and what I think I'd like to change. So these, let's tame those, that warmth a little bit. Let's make them sound a little bit more contemporary as opposed to sounding like the you know early 2000s early to mid 2000s and uh, for these it's like can we get that weirdness out of the way and give it a, a, a slow roll into the bass as opposed to that weird little depression thing that they have going on those both sound like fairly reasonable changes to make as I've described them um, so now what I want to do is I want to take a, an existing profile and have a look at the frequency charts for them and see if I can see what I think I'm hearing. If I can see what I think I'm hearing, then we can start to try to make changes based on that. And the goal here is to modify them to my taste, but as little as possible to preserve, you know, what they are. The more you try to change them, the more you're going to be pushing the device. If you try to get, you know, try to put 12 dB of bass boost at, at 30 hertz on these things, you're going to be pushing those drivers awfully hard if you turn them up. It's not going to sound good. It's going to distort. It's going to do bad things. But maybe 3 or 4 or 5 dB of bass boost might be more reasonable depending on your listening levels and maybe that's okay. So you don't, you know, you don't want to overdo it because you have to stay within the physical limitations of the device you have. You're not going to make, um, you know, these into, you know, Bayer's with their huge Mare Dramatic, you know, like 990's with their you know, base extension. You know, that's never going to happen out of these, right? Just not. And you're also not going to make them, you know, incredibly fat, like the flat, like the, like the 600s, like the Sennheiser HD 600s. You're just not going to get that. Um, the same with these, right? The more you muck about with them, at some point you're, you're not helping. You're making it worse. So minimal. So the goal here in the philosophy is minimal changes to make them fit my taste better, but not to change the essence of them if that makes sense too much. So let me get these off the uh, iPad and we'll open it up. We'll turn it on and uh, see where that takes us. You notice that I've got the JBLs out of their case here and that's necessary to connect with them on the app. I'm on the iPad. Normally I would do this on my phone, but this is what we've got. And we can look at uh, JBL's app here. You know, you could turn on Noise cancelling, great. Noise cancelling on these is useful, but not super great. Uh, we have the equalizer. We've got, you know, the various modes. They're, you know, they do what you'd expect for a middle of the range, um, you know, true wireless noise cancelling IEM 
don't expect too much. And what we can see with the equalizer is you can see what I've got done with it. Well, going here, you can see that a little better. Um, so this is just currently the one that's programmed so that the application sends the uh, profile to the IEMs and the, uh, the equalization is done in the IEMs. It's not done um, in, the, in the device, in the tablet or whatever. So uh, and that's convenient because you can then connect to something else and does actually this is this profile you can tell by the naming of it that this is one that was in these and that I sent from my phone. This one I've renamed here at some point. Okay. So this is where I went and you can see what I've done. I've turned up the uh, you know just starting in the lower mids and the upper base turns up then there's a fairly steep curve down it at uh, 64 and the, on the 64 hertz uh, band and then it comes up a little bit towards the sub base at the end. So you can see that it's, and there's a little bit of a, of a probably not hearable um, dip um, in the upper mid range just to balance out that uh, this bottom a little bit. It's a fairly minor change, right? Although this is, I think, minus 3 dB, so it's, you know, that's, that's fairly consistent. But it really does change the sound of these things quite dramatically, and it makes them go from being, they're a little weird, to being, oh, yeah, those are all right. Which is, I mean, I'm not asking for more than that out of them, right? Um, but that's not where I started. I started here. Now look at what this is doing. This is making a very similar change down here. It's really drawing down the, uh, the mid-range quite substantially and then it's doing some weirdness here to move the peak towards 8 kilohertz. And then it's totally dropping off at 16k. Now I'm over 50 I'm not hearing that anyway. So anything that's going on on this slider is probably not affecting me at all, or very minimally. That's weird. So why would we go from there to there? And I will say these, this actually sounds all right, but it, like whatever it's doing here at the top, it just kind of kills them. So let's have a look at where this comes from. This is where that comes from. This is autoeq.app. This is I think for someone like me who was just starting out playing with EQ, this is a, an excellent place to start with. It has some recommendations. It recommends sound source directly, right? And it gives you some instructions. Set up your head, select your headphones at the top, select the equalizer app you're using, hear the difference with a live demo, well that we won't do, and then copy settings to the equalizer app. And that's the important part here. So let's look these up. JBL Tune 130 Noise Cancelling TWS. That's them. Alright, so let's walk through what we see here. Okay, I'm going to hide. So what we're seeing here in light blue is the target. And the target is the curve that we've decided these should meet when tested in a relatively standard um, device, right? Because these have to be put into a device that simulates the ear and, you know, full-size headphones would need to be on a phony head that simulates the ear to, because headphones don't operate like speakers in the middle of a room, you can't test them in an anechoic chamber. They've got to be tested in some analog of attaching them to a human body. So when we're looking at headphones, we have to choose a curve that we'd like them to follow. So we have to choose what target curve we're going to use. And this is the uh, target curve that, um, that we've got up here right now. If we go back to what I was doing here, you'll see that the other curve here is ratings auto EQ in ear. So that's what this website is going to generate 
is what this is set for when the EQ is set that way. So let's look at how we generate that, and then I'll talk about how I got to here. So to generate this, we put it in and we said, well, so we'll leave this target curve on. We'll set the equalizer app to 10 band graphic equalizer. And what it does is it tells you what you should adjust each of the sliders to, to meet that target cane. We can't adjust the preamp gain here, but my suspicion is, is that it automatically does that um, once it's sent with these sorts of things. So what we have is we have, okay, so you make all those sliders match that. And that, that, that's what I was doing before. Now you can also choose other, so, if, so we can look at what the data would look like. So there's the raw data, that's what they recorded from these things. And then we can look at the equalize. That's the result of the equalizer. So you can see that they've made it match the target curve fairly closely. Now there's a smoothing function. If you choose smoothing function, take the smoothing off, you get um, you see much more noise around the top. Now some of this is going to be due to measurement problems. Some of this is going to be due to possibly issues with these in the high frequencies. It looks really quite odd. But I want to show you something else. You don't have to just use this. You could look at the Harman. Um, where do we get, let's see, what's going on here? Harman in-ear curve. Now the Harman in-ear curve is made by Harman, which owns Harman Kardon, but also owns JPL. So presumably it was in the minds of the engineers who developed this. The Harman curve, like any of these curves, are designed based on what people like. They aren't right, they aren't wrong. They're just what people like. And the Harman ones are made by, uh, were made by originally um, Harman surveying their own staff, I believe, and uh, setting up an experimental setup where people could adjust what these frequencies looked like in a certain kind of listening environment, and that's what they've, uh, and that's what this is designed to do. Now, let's take the uh, equalized one out, and if you look at the Harman curve and you look at these things, they're pretty close. They're a little off it up here, but it sure looks like these were designed to follow the Harman curve, except there's some weirdness going on here. This is the upper base, lower mid-range, it's depressed, and there's a big weird shelf up here on the, um, in the base, and that's exactly what I reported was what I didn't like. So this is what I didn't like about them. Now, if you set it for Harman, you'll get slightly different results. And if you actually look at those numbers, they're very close to what I'm using on the AutoEQ app. So what we have is we have something that looked a bit weird compared to ratings curve, and if you put smoothed on right, it makes even more sense, it's more obvious. Um, so let's look at that, and let's just go back to the changes that I'm making. So here's a little S-bend, which is designed to compensate for this, right? And you've got a little bit of a dip down here, sorry, going the wrong way, which is designed to compensate for the worst of that. And this, I haven't touched. And probably this deviation here is a bit, I mean, you can take smoothing off and you can see that it's why I haven't touched it, right? That when you smooth it, it looks like it dips over there. But when you take smoothing off, you realize that it's bouncing around a lot. And so my decision is not to touch this, to only go from about 3K down 
and then to essentially use these values for about 3k down. The other thing that I do is you'll notice that this um, this actually has a little bit of a bump up on the base and I've chosen not to let the base go up quite as high as this does. So I'm still keeping the base a little bit lower than this one. And I've used some other curves as well. So what you can do is you can put these numbers in. You can put, you can try the Harman in here. You can try the ratings one. You can try, you know, other uh, versions. that are available here, right? You can try other ver slightly different versions of the Harman that's over ear. You do want in ear because we're talking about in ear monitors, right? But uh, so that's the process, right? You start with something of like this, you implement the part of it that you think is going to be useful. So to hear, see if you like that, see if you like those changes. Then you can try some of the upper stuff. You can decide whether it's useful to you or not. I, as you'll see, as I'll explain later, don't think that these numbers are necessarily reliable, so therefore I don't like to make changes. Don't trust the smooth numbers. Look at the raw ones a little bit. And, uh, and so what you're trying to do is correct large, and this is the key thing in my view, large deviations from whatever your chosen target curve is. And for most people, that target curve should probably start at Harman, and then you decide. Like I decide, okay, this base boost is a little bit too much here. We'll draw it down a little bit more. That makes them a little relatively brighter. Be less base boost on it. Um, they're still, by my standards, relatively. I mean, they're neutral, but they're a little dark. And just to explain, if you look at what the app is trying to do, so that's the raw data, that's the target. I won't show you the equalized, I'll show you the error. So what it does is it calculates an error. We'll hide the target and the raw. This is the error, and we can smooth that if we want, right? But this is the error from the, uh, the target frequency response. And you'll often see these kinds of graphs. Um, when people talk about them. So the error's off the target, so there, you know, it's 3 dB off the target up there. And that's actually a fairly significant hump off the Harman target, right? And here we're up, you know, 2 dB, a dB and a half, right? And then these are the numbers that are generated on the graphic equalizer. If you were using a different app to equalize it, so for example, if I was doing this on the computer, which of course I also, you could use SoundSource, which is the app I'm using on the computer. Um, and it gives you a different kind of equalizer. So it gives you the results that you would use for a, um, for a, a parametric equalizer. So a parametric equalizer allows you to set a center frequency for each of the filters. It allows you to set a filter type. It allows you to set a Q, which is how wide the filter is. And then it looks a little different with a low shelf. And then it allows you to set the gain, which is how big the change is. So you can see the low shelf, the gain is very minimal. Right, The high shelf, they're using it to cut off the top. And then each of these function as uh, different uh, Filter. So and when and you look at the equalized and you compare it to using the parametric equalizer, you can see that it's almost spot on, right, through here. So the parametric equalizer gives you a much um, tighter control over the sound than using a graphic equalizer. Well, it's using, you know, because you can set each of the filters individually. Now, AutoEQ app is great for starting. It's great for looking at various things. It's great for figuring out some possible settings to start from. But these are all worked out algorithmically by the website, by a computer. They aren't settings that would be designed by a person, possibly, 
for these sorts of things. And my preference, I think, is to start with settings that are designed by a person. I was having a sip of coffee here. Having a by, but I prefer to start with settings by a person who has made some decisions about what sounds right with the particular devices that we want. All this stuff in the upper end I think is dumb and I don't think there should be much attempt to do it with these. And I think a person trying to do set up ideal settings would probably not bother or would make slightly different choices about how they would attempt to muck around with the upper frequencies. What I want to do now is turn from talking about the JBLs to talking about the Sennheisers. Now I've had these for a long time. I like them, but they're warm and they're a, they're a kind of tuning that's, that, it, I mean, I don't know if it's out of style or not what people expect as much anymore. It doesn't sound anything like Harman. So let's have a look at their frequency response and see where that takes us. Here's an example of frequency responses for these. Right? done by Oratory 1990 and his proposed equalization for these. And this is equalization using a graphic equalizer. We'll look at a parametric equalizer for these in a little bit. So he's measured them. And so here we have Harman over ear. These are over ear headphones, so we'll use the over ear, not the in ear measurements. Harman over ear. We've got the raw frequency response, right? So there's the raw frequency news. And you can notice that unlike these, this has no relationship to the Harman curve at all. And we also notice that the Harman curve for over ears has much less bass boost on it than in ears. But this is a subject of some debate as to what the appropriate curve is. I think the Harman curve actually has too much bass boost for in-ears, um, but different people have different um, feelings about how, how it should look. And we can see here, we can see essentially the error chart. He calls it the compensated frequency response, which is essentially you take this frequency response, you use the Harman curve as the center line, so that's the dotted line here, and that gives you a frequency response along the Harman curve so you can see the error essentially. You can see the deviation from the forecast. And what we can see is it's very warm. There's a huge, it's pretty well the opposite of the JBLs. There's a huge peak in the, uh, in the upper bass, lower mids. Um, and then the high frequency follows the Harman curve pretty well. Uh, and they are open back headphones, so they don't have much low bass, but it trails off pretty well, as you would expect. So that would suggest that what you would want to do if you're trying to equalize these is you want to bring those, that warm part down. So you want to turn down the, uh, the mid range, lower mid range and upper bass, and you'd want to possibly pump up the um, lower bass a little bit to the extent you can reasonably with these things. So what we have is we know what we are trying to do. We can look at the frequency response graph and it tells us a lot about, or it tells me a lot anyway, about what I'm hearing. Here is uh, after Oratory's put together his equalization profile, there is what it looks like with EQ, right? So we can see that it follows the Harman curve quite closely. You can see that he's trying to move this peak over here a little bit, so over that way a little bit in the highs, but mostly he's trying to tame the mid-range a little bit and try to boost up the, uh, the low end. So we can see he provides us with the individual filter curves, so what each of the individual filters is doing and then this is when you add that all up, you end up with the total equalization curve. The histogram over here shows the error distribution without EQ, and this is with EQ. So the idea is that shows you how much you deviation you had from Harman before, and this shows you how much deviation from Harman you had after. And these are the filter settings. 
and uh, these are uh, you can ignore the Q factor here and I'll just you can ignore all of this because that's not really relevant for a graphic equalizer because they all have the same Q factor. And so you can see it looks just like what we saw from auto EQ. We have the center frequencies of each of the bands in the graphic equalizer and we have the gain. And you'll see that I've marked the top six bands because those are the ones that I'm actually using and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, similarly, we can look at the version with a parametric equalizer. So if we look down at the bottom, we can see that these are now parametric uh, equalizer settings. So we have the same low shelf, high shelf filters. We have um, the gains. We have what frequency it's set at, which can be set individually for each of these. And we have the Q factor. Um, the bandwidth and the Q factor are the same thing. They're just different ways of representing it depending on um, what parametric equalizer you're using. Some use the Q factor, some use the bandwidth. Most, I think, use Q factor. Um, anyway, and so for these, you can see the various settings. You can see there's some fairly large moves being made here. And you can also see that I've selected to pay attention to the first four bands. And uh, I've made some changes. I've decided that the gain in the bass should be a little bit more modest for dB. And band 4, I've made a little bit more modest as well as 1.2. And that's because my intention is not to use these upper filters. And here you can start to see. So you can start to see filter 1, filter 2, filter 3, filter 4. And I'm not using filter 5, filter 6, and any of this upper stuff. Again, I'll explain a little bit more why I think that's the case um, later on. So how do we actually implement that? Well, I can't quite show it to you on um, on SoundSource directly because I don't I don't have the computer in front of me. But this is what the file looks like that you would import into SoundSource. And I will say SoundSource can directly load these directly from Oratory. You don't actually have to do this. You can just pick this this filter set and it will just do it. Uh, so we can see that we have all those. Filter 1, right, on. Um, and then we have uh, the same, right? So we have frequency, the gain, and the Q factor, right? So exactly the same as was in the file. At the uh, regular graphic equalizer, example. And of course, as I mentioned before, sometimes or often I use these headphones with this. And if I'm not in front of the computer, it might be nice to have a, uh, a filter for them loaded into it. And in fact, I do. And let me show you how that works. So now we can see the, uh, the control interface for it. So we can see the codec and what it's supposed to look like and a variety of functions which we can change. Uh, you can force it to use a particular Bluetooth codec. But most importantly, we can look at the equalizer. So here we have the equalizer, which is not turned on at the moment because it was connected to the computer. But um, you can see that that's just an implementation of this. Again, with a few, I've changed. I've lowered the band 1 peak to, I think, 4 dB. I can't remember. Yeah, to, to 4, D, 4 dB there. And uh, so I've made a few changes, but uh, mostly that follows. It follows this. Again, right, the idea was what was the goals here? I didn't want to mess around with the high frequencies. I thought they were fine. I had no um, major problems with them. And as I said, the uh, HD 598s have really quite nice imaging, and I didn't want to mess that up too much by messing around with the high end. And I didn't think it was necessary because I found the high end pleasant enough. So my choice is to, you know, 
leave the high end alone and, uh, and just mess around with the part that was bothering me in the frequency response, which is that. And I'm really quite pleased with that as a solution for these. And again, the goals are modest, right? It's not to change these. You're never going to make these totally neutral. You're never going to make them sound like something they're not. But you can tame this because it's not really to your, uh, to your liking. And so that's what I tried to do. Now, in both of these cases, with both the JBLs and the Sennheisers, I chose not to try to move around where the high frequency response peak was, where we see that go up. And I want to talk a little bit about why that's the case. So I will close up the iPad. We will go back to the official doing headphone stuff requirement of putting things on an iPad. And then I'll talk a little bit about that. And then hopefully it will make sense to you. So I'm not convinced that the measurements that reviewers, headphone designers, whomever, when they're making measurements, that they measure my ears. Whenever you put headphones on a jig of whatever sort to measure them, they are impinging on imaginary ear canals. Right? They've got something, if you're talking about full-size headphones, they're talking, you're talking about something that's shaped like an ear, is designed to have similar acoustic properties. And it might get really close, but it's not my ears. That's even more of the case for IEMs. IEMs use a resonant cavity. They're in essentially like closed back, although these kind of these are semi-open, I suppose, because they've got a vent. But uh, they're kind of like closed back headphones, but the, 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 the resonant cavity that they're using is your ear canal, because they seal. What, whatever's back here matters less than this side, which seals into your ear canal, and that's the resonant cavity. And relatively small changes in the size and shape of your ear canal are going to have effects on what the resonant frequency of that canal is, and that's going to drive where that big peak on the, uh, on the frequency diagram is. So unless you've done so much listening that you have a pretty good idea of how close your ear canal is to what those measurements look like, I think you should be making change. You should be very leery about making changes to anything above, let's say, four or five thousand hertz, in the frequency response profile of headphones when uh, EQing them. My feeling is is that if you're trying to move the peak over, which is what you know what they're trying to do, what Oratory is trying to do with these ones, I think. I mean, do you need to? Is it really off? Is it off that much? I think that's really hard to tell. In the IEM world, there's been a lot of discussion about which kind of measurement rigs people are using and whether they're comparable to each other. And that's great when you're comparing measurements of one IEM to another. But that still doesn't tell you what your ears sound like. Unless you stick microphones down your own ears, shove in your IEMs, and do measurements that way, you can't possibly know, except by listening, what the relationship is between um, the, the uh, frequency response diagram you see on whatever website you use and what your ears are experiencing. So there is nothing objective by the time it gets to your ears about what headphones sound like in terms of the frequency response. However, at the low end, because of the physical length of our ear canals, they are shorter than the sound wave lengths below, I can't remember quite what the number is, let's say 4,000 hertz, right? So that means that for those numbers, the frequency diagrams that you see are relatively accurate. And well, you can develop a measurement device that gets consistent replicatable results when two different people measure the same IEMs, 
or measure the same earphones. When a person puts them in their ears or puts them on their head, they're going to hear something different. And the difference that they hear is going to be greater in the higher frequency range than in the lower frequency range. In the lower frequency range, the graphs that you see are more likely to be reflecting what you will hear than in the upper frequency range. Well, I think I'm right about this. That makes sense to me. So in terms of informing setting up your equalization profiles, you should pay more attention to what's going on at the lower end than you should to what's in the upper end. In the upper end, you should just do what you like. That's where I've gotten on this EQing. So if I'm buying headphones and I'm thinking that I might want to EQ them, and I should say, frankly, I will I wouldn't buy headphones that I felt the need to EQ right now. But, you know, if you wanted to take a peek down at 8,000 or whatever in, Bayer, in Bayer's is too high for a lot of people, that's fine. I mean, you can do that, right? If you have ones that you want to warm up, you want to put a little bit of a hump in the, uh, in the lower middle range, no problem. You can do that. You want to turn up the bass a little bit. You want to turn up the highs generally a little bit. Yeah, you could do that. But I think if you're trying to remove something that is sort of wrong, you shouldn't buy them. Buy headphones that you like, buy he or and then tweak them a little bit to to your needs. And I will say, I'm making big changes in these things. I'm just not doing them in the upper end. So those are my thoughts on this topic. Um, I don't suspect they're everybody's, and I'm sure I'm wrong about some things, but it feels like a reasonable approach to me. Let me know your thoughts in the uh, comments if you think otherwise, and, uh, and maybe there's something else I need to read or learn about. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me through this relatively long video. Have a good afternoon.